All right. Uh, welcome everyone to the last session of the conference, and it's a session in composability, consensus, and Byzantine agreement. Um, so for our first talk, um, we have Michele Ciampi, who is going to talk about agile cryptography, a universally composable approach. Michele, take it away. Okay. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Yeah, this is a joint work with uh, Christian Badersher and uh, Agalos Chaos. So I'm gonna just uh, iterate what uh, Brian Lamacchia have said in a few of his uh, very interesting public talks, which is that basically uh, cryptographic algorithms uh, evolve. Cryptographic algorithms, uh, algorithms can be broken. You need to change them, you need to update them. That's a very fundamental thing. And this has happened a lot in history. And so that's something we need to take care of. And that's actually something that in practice we do. In practice, we do update softwares and in particular, we update cryptographic, uh, cryptographic software. That's, it's very important to do. And so that's why uh, we consider, people have considered in the past, the notion of cryptographic agility, right? Which is the ability to reconfigure an application or system with different cryptographic algorithms. And you may want to do that because just um, you think your protocol may not be secure or because you want to add some features. I mean, there are many reasons why you want to do that. And the point is that as I said, this happens a lot in practice, but what we do in theory is that like, we, we have a protocol on the whiteboard, we write the paper, we make the proof, we submit to the CC, and that's perfect. That's gonna be there forever. No need to, you know, to do any change. And so it's natural then to ask, like, if we do care about cryptographic agility and update in practice, why, why don't we care more even in theory? And so, and that's what I'm trying to, to cover and to discuss in this talk. And all this discussion will be done uh, uh, in the UC framework, okay? Um, where what you have is your, your usual real and uh, ideal world, right? So what happens in the real world is that you have uh, parties running a protocol, they are at version B1, and this protocol realizes a functionality F1, okay? Standard stuff. So now what happens is that for some reason, parties want to update and want to uh, run version two of this protocol. So what you would expect is that in the ideal world, this corresponds to part is being registered to a new functionality F2, and uh, that's the update. So you may think that this just corresponds to functionality they're registering from the functionality F1 and registered to functionality F2 and everything is fine. But that's not, that's not true. That's not what happens. That's not what uh, really an update is because you don't want to lose maybe something that uh, you did using the previous functionality. Uh, so what it means is that there is something which is the state of the functionality of the functionality F1 that you may want to preserve uh, and keep to the functionality F2. Also like who decides when to update and like uh, to what functionality. Like do we wait for the majority of the parties to say that or do we wait for a leader party to say, okay, let's update now. And also, as I said, we may want to update because things can be broken. But what, is, what does it mean that things break in, uh, in the universe of things do? So the two contributions of this uh, uh, talk are discussing actually what it means for something to be broken in the real world, uh, in a real world protocol, and, that, and then how to capture agility uh, in the UC framework so that we, can, we have the right language, the right tools to talk about this and so on a theory side. So when you uh, design a protocol, a real world protocol, what you have is that parties like need to rely on some cryptographic assumptions or on some primitives, for example, encryption, or the fact that the decisional decision on one uh, assumption fold, right? So then you use these primitives, you use these uh, assumptions and you build your amazing uh, uh, protocols, right? They run from concurrency, UC allows that, that's fantastic. And what happens is that if some of these primitives are broken, then your protocol may be broken as well. But again, what does it mean that a primitive or that, uh, for example, an encryption scheme is broken? How do you capture that? Um, so the way we capture this in the real world is by um, considering a special uh, hybrid functionality, which is called fcom as in uh, f-computation. And basically, any time you need to run, uh, execute an algorithm, for example, an encryption algorithm, what you do is that you initialize this functionality with the algorithm. And when you want to evaluate the algorithm, you query this algorithm through this functionality. And then you can use the output um, as a protocol message for your complicated MVC protocol or whatever. So you can keep doing that. And at some point, um, you may uh, have this type of commands 
which is a subcorrupt command from an adversary, uh, which basically allows the adversary to get the internal state of this uh, um, AFCON subroutine. So this means that kind of like everything, uh, all the secrets you may have uh, given to this AFCON are leaked to the adversary. And actually from that point on, anytime uh, you want to query your algorithm, actually your queries were forwarded to the adversary and this adversary that decides how to answer this. Okay, that's how you capture how things are, when things are broken in a real world protocol. And this allows to capture also the fact that the assumptions may be broken. Uh, so for example, if you need to sample the Fielman tuples and most likely you're doing that because you're relying on a Fielman assumptions, well, what happens is that you do sample your tuple inside this, um, this hybrid functionality. And then when this, um, when the DFM assumption doesn't hold anymore, uh, what happens is that this corresponds to action on adversary sending a subcorruption command so that the exponents are. Okay. So now this is how we model uh, the fact that things can break down. Let's say how we model agility. So the way we want to model agility is as follows. So we imagine that there, are, there is a set of parties registered to a functionality F1. This functionality has a state. Now, what happens is that maybe different parties want to update to a different functionality because, I don't know, they feel more comfortable running F being registered to F2 instead of F3 or F1, and uh, they like uh, more the interface of this new functionality. Um, so you can have forks. It's, uh, you know, this has happened in the past for uh, um, in computer science that people didn't like any, you know, a software implementation, so decided to adopt two different software implementations. And so one of these... Um, functionality may be compromised, and you want to heal from it. So you want to heal, it, it means that you want to be registered maybe to another functionality while maintaining, maintaining actually part of the history, part of the state, that's how we call it here, okay? And then you may have end up in the situation where you merge uh, the parties, the state again, and uh, like now you have this great functionality of five that has great properties and everybody like it. So the way we model this is uh, by designing this wrapper that we call, it's a big functionality, we call f-update, which is parameterized by three things. So first of all, there is a class of uh, functionality that uh, this wrapper supports. Uh, this is needed because, as I said, you want to preserve the state uh, between updates, and this makes sense only if like the states are, the functionality have, functionalities have state that are compatible with each other. You have an update predicate that uh, describes when the update is triggered. For example, when the majority of the parties decide to update or when there is a leader party that decides to don't update. I'll show you an example. And, and then a uh, state update, which says which part of the state we want to preserve. Maybe you don't want to preserve everything. Maybe you are concerned about actually um, some messages were, were included. So you want to preserve only a prefix or, the, or a subset of the things you have generated so far using this functionality, okay? Um, so I'm going to show you an example. Uh, of how the ideal world looks like when you have this wrapper and how the real world looks like uh, for the case where you have signatures, okay? So this is the standard signal functionality. Uh, you are all familiar with it, I suppose. So uh, the signal functionality has a designated verifier, uh, very, a designated signer. So anytime um, I want to sign something, the signer says, okay, please sign this message for me. Uh, the functionality uh, gives back some uh, special message, a special signature message to the signer. And the functionality records all the messages that are signed, okay? Now, when a verifier wants to verify, it asks, asks the functionality, you know, whether the message and do uh, with the signature is two and uh, the verification key, whether, whether this tuple is, uh, it belongs to this uh, database that uh, the functionality is registering. And if that's the case, then the functionality returns one, otherwise, okay, that's very easy. So what happens in, um, in our framework is that this app update um, will maintain uh, F1, which is a signature functionality. And anytime there is a, um, there is a query uh, related to signing messages or verifying messages, this wrapper for words acts as a proxy for all these messages okay? between uh, like the parties and F1, which is again a signature functionality. Now what happens is that F update uh, allows also accepts uh, an update from Upon receiving an update command, in this case, the signer can decide to update. There is a new functionality that is generated inside this wrapper, and uh, the state is copied to the new functionality, F2. And now, if a verifier updates, 
or uh, like when any verifier updates and uh, if a verifier that has updated as a query, this query will be forwarded actually to F1, to F2 instead of F1, okay? That's how you keep track kind of of the, of the updates and that's what you want in terms of state preservation for this very simple example of state, okay? And the point is that you can also have that uh, the functionality is maybe compromised at any point via this subproduct command, but the thing is that this should not affect security, okay? This should not affect the security, what you expect from a security. So how do you realize that? Um, so here we're gonna, we wanna consider the case where an adversary can corrupt a functionality, a signature functionality, even before the update, of course. So as you can imagine, this is not easy to do unless you assume some, some form of setup. And the form of setup we assume here, it's like, um, the existence of another uh, signature scheme, which we call uh, F code. I'll talk about this uh, later. So, but the overall idea is that like uh, you parties can use a, uh, this uh, F code signature scheme, and then at some point the signature scheme may be compromised. But what you can do is that you can heal. You can heal because the signer now, once that wants to update your new functionality F two, can actually uh, hash all the messages that uh, he has ever generated and sign these messages using this uh, F code scheme, which is again, just a standard signature scheme. And uh, like the, then your update information are made by like the set of messages and the hash, which is signed with this uh, code signature scheme. Okay? So after that, the signer has updated, all the signatures, all the new uh, messages that need to be signed will be signed using this new functionality. And now anytime a verifier needs to verify a signature, uh, the verifier will check whether the signature verifies uh, against the uh, um, new signature scheme or whether this message belong to this uh, um, set of messages that are denoted with uh, uh, bold uh, M. Okay? And now you can say, okay, well done. You have realized an updatable signature scheme using another signature scheme, fantastic. Um, so the point is that uh, this makes sense because you may have the situation where these uh, uh, signature schemes, F old and F new or F one and F two, like they are very efficient schemes, but for example, they may not be post quantum secure. Okay, uh, and then you can have F cold, which is kind of uh, a good scheme, uh, but it's very slow. It's post quantum secure, and but it has stronger uh, security uh, guarantees. Okay? So the idea is that when you expect things to go fine and you don't want to update, you just use fast schemes. And only the few times that you believe that you need an update or you, that you believe that there is something wrong going on, you rely on the on the on the on the slower signature scheme that in turn gives you better security and can support you with the update. Okay, this is a very simple example, um, but you can um, extend these to other settings, for example, to the zero knowledge setting. And indeed, we have a similar result uh, for uh, this case. And we also consider the case where you want to update um, implementation of pseudorandom uh, functions uh, while maintaining the same secret key. This is something, a problem that has been considered uh, in the past in the context of a cryptographic agility and our framework captures this actually. Um, so what is the main takeaway then of this uh, talk uh, is that uh, cryptographic protocol need to be updated. And this should be considered when you think about the protocol, when you design it, or when you uh, prove it secure with respect to some idealized word. And um, yeah, so basically more or less uh, that's it for the other results I mentioned, I uh, would recommend you to look at uh, the paper and uh, I conclude uh, yeah, by saying that, yeah, if you wanna work uh, with, with me, uh, reach me out. So thank you very much. Thanks Michele. Uh, we have time for a couple of quick questions. Okay, if there are no questions, let's thank the speaker again. So for our next talk, um, we have Michael Close, who's going to talk about uh, composable long-term security with rewinding.
Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to talk about our work, uh, Composable Long-Term Security with Rewinding, which is joined with uh, Robin, Brendan, Jeremias, Jan, Asle, and Markus. Uh, and so first, uh, I can clarify what I mean by Composable. Uh, we're considering a UC-type notion, so universal composability, uh, where the security experiment uh, looks like this. So we want to compare a real protocol pi with an ideal functionality f. And um, in the real world, there is a real adversary A and an environment. And in the ideal world, there's the ideal adversary, the simulator S, uh, and the environment as well, which tries to distinguish this real and ideal uh, situations. Uh, and well, computational UC security says these situations are indistinguishable uh, for any holy time adversary and then this thing. Now, uh, maybe maybe computational security is not enough for us and we want something stronger. Uh, for example, uh, we might consider statistical UC security uh, where all the parties are unbound. Uh, now, unfortunately, in that setting, we need quite strong setups. Uh, so maybe we want something in between. Uh, so we can look at the setting of uh, long-term UC security. Uh, where we have this PPT uh, execution, basically. So adversary, uh, simulator, and the environment are now PPT, um, but the distinguisher will still be unbound. And uh, this allows us to use hardness assumptions uh, during the protocol execution. Um, but after the protocol finish, we have now statistical security guarantees, basically. Uh, so even if we use RSA in our protocol, and then quantum computers are constructed, um, everything will be fine if we finish the protocol execution before quantum computers have been constructed. And so this is like uh, relating it to the talk before, a very uh, binary type of uh, agility. Uh, we kind of are secure uh, if, yeah, if the protocol is completed. And with long-term security, the situation is a bit better uh, with what we can achieve. So for example, we know that uh, we can construct a commitment scheme from only a signature part um, or even different assumptions. Uh, but unfortunately, there are still quite strong impossibility results. Uh, namely, we cannot construct long-term secure commitments from just the CRM. CRS hybrid model doesn't help us. Um, and very roughly, the, the Problem here is that if we have just a CRS, well, then if the CRS would not result in statistically hiding commitments, the distinguisher can break them. But if the CRS gives us statistically hiding commitments, then the simulator cannot break them, so it, it cannot extract them. And we cannot just switch between statistically hiding and not statistically hiding commitments because the distinguisher can distinguish this switch. So what, what do we do? Well, there's one SK patch, uh, we might not have straight line simulation anymore. We might look at winding rate simulation. And this is uh, what we did in this work. Uh, so in our work, we define this notion of long-term rewinding UC, um, where we consider an angel-based notion. Uh, I will explain that in a second. Um, this allows us to construct uh, commitments from only a CRS uh, in this long-term rewinding secure sense. Uh, we can also construct an OT protocol, which has a kind of one-sided security. So we can statistically protect either sender or receiver, um, but we prove that it's impossible to achieve full UC security. So we cannot protect statistically both sender and receiver. Um, and to, to formalize all of this, we introduce a, a new tool, uh, which we call pseudo oracles, uh, which are oracles which can rewind. Uh, and now, uh, let's Okay, this is some, some more detail. Uh, so what is angel-based UC security? So in angel-based security, there's this global entity, uh, which is called helper or angel, and it will offer special powers to all parties or it has special powers and offers these to usually used only by simulator environment and adversary, um, but in principle also honest parties could use it. And uh, for example, this power might be that the angel will brute force the committed values of some statistically binding scheme. And it will only do so in 
judiciously chosen uh, situations, uh, which are made so that the simulator benefits from this, but the adversary doesn't. And when you look at the specific um, angel, well, our construction is, is based on this uh, prior work from Kanethi Lin Pass and Dorian Gong, um, which is a rewinding simulated angel. So the angel itself is just a straight line angel, which offers us a CCA commitment game. Uh, this means we can concurrently run many CCA commitment sessions with this uh, angel. And once we finish such a commitment, the angel will brute force extract the committed value and tell us what we, what we committed to. And uh, as I said before, this angel has the nice property that it is rewinding simulated. So think of it as, as this angel having many rounds in, in which you prove that you actually know what's inside the commitment. Um, and so we can kind of, by using rewinding, simulate this angel without doing brute force the extraction, but doing rewinding based extraction. And now we're in the ninth position where we can use the straight line angel doing brute force extraction uh, when we need to see simulation. Uh, but when we want to do security reductions to, well, the hardness of, of P log or breaking signatures, um, where it might be a problem to have this super poly power uh, in, in, in the game, we can just remove it by using rewinding. And now there is a technical caveat, uh, namely, uh, we cannot rewind the security game we're trying to, to, to play. So if we just rewind a UFCMA uh, game, then we, yeah, we might kind of not do a proper uh, signature uh, forgery. So uh, what we have as an extra property is the K robustness here, which basically says that we can exclude K messages from ever being rewound. And so we can have what, what is called a left side here on this picture is B, uh, and B will never be rewound by this uh, rewinding simulation. And this is what we, we base our construction on. Uh, we also use a CCA commitment oracle, um, constructed somewhat differently, uh, because we need rewinding-based simulation and not just rewinding simulatable uh, uh, angels. And for that, we need to define what it means that an oracle or an angel can rewind. And, uh, as I, yeah, let me first I'll say what an oracle does. So an oracle basically is just an ITM, it's a stateful machine. You can send a message to it. It will respond with an oracle response. And this makes it inherently unable to rewind anything. Um, so we define this notion of pseudo oracle, which when you send it a message, it, it actually gets the state of the caller, like not yeah, the state, the view of the caller. And thus it can rewind the caller in its head and yeah, do rewinding things. Um, and well, one thing is that this behaves very differently from usual oracles. So the properties are different. So as a first thing, we, we just want to deal with these two oracles when they are actually black box. So they should not really use the U of A um, because that's uh, harder to deal with. They should just use A as a black box. Now as a second property, we want that we basically have the rewinding base, uh, the rewinding simulatability from these prior works. So as long as we have some K round uh, left side, we want to be able to replace uh, the Oracle with a simulator, with a rewind based uh, simulation uh, so that the output are those. And finally, we want a notion which we call a K robust comp composition order invariance. And that is a crucial notion uh, which I'll explain on the next slide. So with Oracles, uh, all of this is trivial. Uh, and what all of this is about is what happens if we compose two systems in, in different ways? So on the left side, you see that we first connect A with this pseudo oracle, and then we connect this composed system with B. And on the right side, we well, we first connect B and A, and then we plug in the pseudo oracle. Now, what does this mean for pseudo oracles? It means that on the left side, uh, the pseudo oracle gets the view of A, or it, it gets black box access to A, but it's it's unable to rewind B. On the right side, it's able to rewind this machine B composed with A. So this is inherently very different. And what composition order invariance guarantees uh, for pseudo oracles is that nevertheless, the, the outputs are statistically indistinguishable. 
Um, and with this, uh, I can address some maybe major question about all of this. What What is the meaning if we have like a rewinding based helper? So we have this ideal functionality, say it's OT. Um, and now we rewind the ideal functionality and um, somehow we actually see then both OT messages maybe. Uh, so so what, is, what does this mean? Um, this is uh, where we crucially rely on this composition order invariance because it allows us to exclude the ideal functionality from the rewinding altogether. Uh, and now it, it's meaningful that there is this ideal functionality because it's never rewound. Um, and of course, we need the K robustness. This works for K round uh, ideal functionalities. And K can be chosen arbitrarily large, but uh, that also means that this uh, commitment scheme will need an arbitrarily large number of rounds. Uh, and with that, uh, we conclude. So we define this notion of uh, long-term rewinding UC, which somehow brings a re rewinding based uh, simulation to C. Um, and we give some possibility results. Unfortunately, we also have strong impossibilities. And we define the uh, notion of pseudo oracles to, to handle this rewinding oracle. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, do we have questions? Hi, thanks for the, the talk. So I was wondering, what's the running time of these extractors? Like, I mean, I expect that they are expected polynomial time, right? Not strict. So how does it play a role? It should so, play a role in the reductions, right? Does not properly explain the rewinding, um, but we, we rely on the PRS uh, um, uh, rewinding schedule. Uh, we have a super logarithmic number of rounds um, so that we actually get a polynomial uh, like PPT rewinding. Uh, I think it's a quadratic overhead, um, but but it, everything is PPT. We like this is why we don't use the um, Panetilin pass approach, but uh, based our approach on uh, right. So this approach inherently needs many rounds. Let's say to yeah. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more questions. Well, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, for our next talk, we have uh, Benjamin Chan, and he's going to talk about Simplex Consensus, a fast and simple consensus protocol. Benjamin. Awesome. Thank you. Can you hear me, uh, everyone? Okay, so I'm pleased to uh, now switch gears from UC and composability to uh, Byzantine agreement and consensus, which is, I think, my favorite primitive. It's really pretty. It's really fun to work on. Hope you enjoy it, too. Okay, so this talk... Um, we're going to show you a consensus protocol with the easiest security proofs, uh, which is subjective, of course, uh, and the best latency of all the protocols we've seen thus far. And it's going to be for the partially synchronous F less than n over three PKI setting. I'll go over that later. Um, and why is this important? Well, consensus is a key primitive for blockchains and in particular proof of stake blockchains in this setting, and also for MPC and, and broadcast. And why do we care about easiest uh, or easy security proofs? Well, I think this area has been very well studied. These consensus protocols date back to the 1980s, 1970s. But to this day, in my opinion, our opinion, uh, these protocols, uh, prior work, have largely non-trivial liveness proofs and are relatively hard to intuit still. Um, so we're always looking for a nicer, easier protocol to study and to teach. And our goal is indeed a practical protocol that is intuitive, intuitive enough to just teach in class and uh, 
my goal is uh, maybe when you walk away and you think, hey, how does consensus work? Uh, I hope you think about this protocol. I think it's a high ask, but you know, try. Uh, and I'll try to teach the whole protocol today, including the security proofs in 10 minutes. So uh, see how it goes. Okay, so the setting is the following. We have N players, uh, F of whom are malicious. F is less than N over three. Uh, they're Byzantine faults, static faults for now. Um, and we are in this partial synchronous network, which I'll define soon. We know uh, everyone's public keys ahead of time. So we, we assume a bare PKI. Um, and generally what's going to happen is this. This is the problem. Uh, players are going to receive transactions from this environment over time. Uh, different players may see different orders of transactions. Um, and players will have to continuously output a log of so-called finalized transactions. And we re require two properties here. The first is consistency. Uh, all players must output the same ordering of finalized transactions. This is our agreement property. And uh, next we need liveness, which is that these transactions do eventually get output and finalized by the protocol. Okay, partial synchronous here is a specific model uh, that dates back to 1988 that models an unreliable network setting. So basically the network can be divided into a period of uh, bad network time and good network delivery. Um, so there exists some unknown time GST uh, such that after GST, every message in the network is delivered within bounded time. Uh, and we know an upper bound for this delivery bound. Um, and before GST, there is no guarantee on uh, message delivery. So messages may be delivered out of order, they may be dropped. And here's our theorem statement. Assuming a, beer, a bare PKI and collision resistant hash functions, there exists a partially synchronous random leader consensus protocol for uh, F is less than N over three, static corruptions, and a bunch of latency metrics, uh, which I don't have time to talk about today and uh, really easy security proofs. And that's going to be the focus of my talk, um, really understanding how this protocol works. I will note that we get efficient communication via the techniques of Algorand, uh, so we won't really worry about that. And I think it is worth sort of looking at, hey, there has been a lot of work for protocols exactly in this setting. A lot of them have been deployed on the internet. And I will say that our protocol seems to, at least theoretically, uh, be a little uh, faster and various notions, uh, which I won't have time to go through. A fun quick note before I dive into the actual protocol. Uh, all these protocols differ only slightly in the protocol description. I think consensus is this uh, kind of fun area where you tweak the protocol a little bit and all of a sudden everything changes. Uh, and so our protocol hopefully will give some intuition on why all of these other uh, prior works also work. Okay, are we ready? Protocol description. Okay, so let me set up a bunch of data structures and preliminaries. Uh, the first key data structure is uh, blockchain, uh, which I didn't expect to hear at TCC. Uh, so each block of high H is just going to be a tuple of the form, uh, H comma hash of a whole parent chain, so you're really committing to a whole parent chain, um, and a set of transactions. Okay, and here for the purposes of this talk, we're going to hash all the previous blocks and so on and so forth. We also allow the blockchain to contain these, quote, dummy blocks. This is new to our protocol. Um, a dummy block of high H is just the tuple H comma bot comma bot. Okay? It's an empty block. It doesn't have a parent. And again, every block that's not a dummy block has to extend a parent chain. Um, so uh, once again, uh, every, yeah. Voting for blocks. So a player I quote votes for a block um, by just signing the message. Uh, I vote for I vote for that block B. Okay, and we call a notarized block. Um, uh, well, rather, a block is notarized in my view if I've seen more than two n over three votes for that block, or rather, signatures from more than two n over three players. Dummy blocks can also be notarized. Uh, so if we see signatures from more than 200 or three people for the dummy block. Okay, and a notarized blockchain is just a blockchain where every single block in the chain is also notarized, except for the genesis. And so you might be asking, uh, why 200 or three? What's so special about this, this number? Uh, and uh, the, the neat little lemma that we'll use throughout the talk, and it's very famous, or I mean, everyone uses it, it's called quorum intersection. And the property is if, if, if um, honest players only vote for one of B or B prime, and it cannot be that both 2n over 3 uh, players vote for B and 2n over 3 players vote for B prime. 
right? Why is this true? Um, well, corrupt players can always vote for both of the blocks, um, but you know, honest players here only vote for one of them. So there's n minus f votes on the left side, two f votes on the right side. If you sum them up, there's less than four n over three total um, since our fault tolerance is set less than over three. So form intersection uh, should hold. Okay, we're ready for the protocol, the simplex consensus protocol. We proceed in iterations h equals one, two, three, so on and so forth. And in each iteration h, we'll collectively uh, try to build a notarized block of height h. Okay, so in iteration one, we want to see a notarized block of height one, uh, so on and so forth. And we move to the next iteration only when I've seen a notarized blockchain of length h. And when we do move, uh, we do send this notarized blockchain to everyone else. Let's proceed this. Okay, so how do we actually construct a notarized block within each iteration? Uh, well, first, each iteration will have a leader player chosen randomly ahead of time. Uh, here, uh, we'll just let uh, the leader of iteration H should be um, a hash of the current iteration number mod n. Uh, and we model it via a random oracle, but you can use it and use another hash function. Okay. And now we're ready. So each player on entering iteration H, um, if they're the leader, okay, they're going to choose a notarized blockchain of length H minus one uh, and extend it using a new block, uh, B sub H. And then we're going to send everyone a signed message. Hey, I propose this new block. This new block should contain all pending transactions. And everyone else or all the voters uh, on seeing the first valid proposal from the leader, uh, is going to sign a message, I vote for this block. And importantly, they only do this once. They only do it for the first valid proposal. Um, and of course, if the network is good and we're after GST and the leader is honest, then this block proposal will get notarized uh, eventually, soon. And just to preview, uh, we know that at most one block proposal from the leader will ever be notarized in honest view uh, because of a simple application of our form intersection. Okay, so that seems really nice so far, but how do we handle faults, right? The whole, the whole shebang is handling faults and distributed computation. So like maybe the network drops all the messages or the leader crashed and maybe we just never saw a block proposal. What do we do in the duration? Or maybe a faulty leader sent different people different block proposals so honest players split their votes and no one got two and over three votes. Um, so no block gets notarized. So what do we do? How do we move on? Um, and our solution is dummy blocks. So if three message delays worth of time have passed since a player has entered iteration H, then that player, uh, and that player has not entered the next iteration, uh, then that player will sign a message, hey, I vote for the dummy block of pi H, okay? And I'll vote for the dummy block. Um, and eventually, well, if no one makes progress, everyone's going to sign the dummy block and everyone should see a notarized dummy block in their view, and then subsequently move on to the next iteration. That's quite nice. Now, a quick interlude, uh, just for intuition, uh, you might realize that due to faults, we might see both a notarized block proposal for high H and a notarized dummy block uh, for high H uh, in the view of honest players. Like for instance, maybe Alice saw the leader propose a block and people sign that block and enough signatures. So I see a notarized block proposal for H plus three, but maybe, you know, everyone else timed out due to asynchrony. The messages got dropped and um, voted for the bottom, uh, the dummy block. So maybe Bob sees a notarized dummy block. Uh, like... Note that both of these are valid blocks to extend uh, for the next leader. And I think for an agreement, we really do need to decide on a single block at each height H. And right? this is sort of the agreement property. We wanna choose a blockchain. Okay, so this is the final piece of the protocol. When player I enters iteration H plus one, if I did not time out and vote for the dummy block for H, then player I will send everyone a signed quote, finalize H message. And on seeing two N over three finalized messages uh, for H, a player I finalizes any notarized blockchain of that height and the transactions inside. And now these are final and we have agreements on the contents of this blockchain. And brief intuition, if I do see two N over three finalized messages for H, then no one, no honest player should ever see two N over three dummy votes. Um, so the dummy block of high H cannot be notarized. 
and that's nice. Let me now prove this uh, protocol secure. Um, so first, let's argue consistency. So suppose Alice and Bob are two honest players, um, and Alice outputs some log, and Bob outputs another chain called log prime. Uh, then I claim that Bob's chain extends Alice's chain. Okay, so consider Alice's chain, which is, sorry, without loss of generality, the shorter one, let its length be h. Um, I claim that there can only be one notarized blockchain of length h across all honest views. Okay, and therefore Bob's chain must extend Alice's chain. So the first claim is that at most one block proposal from the leader of h can be notarized in honest view. And this is just because each honest player votes for at most one honest proposal or one proposal. Um, and you apply form intersection. And the second claim is that since Alice finalized this chain, she must have seen two n over three finalized messages for h. And therefore, the dummy block of pi h cannot be notarized in honest view. And again, this is by form intersection because each honest player will either vote finalize or for the dummy block. So that's easy. Bob's chain, by virtue of being notarized, must now extend Alice's chain, and we've just shown you agreement. And here's the liveness proof. This is the, the one that everyone, well, I think most people don't write one down, rather relatively vague. So here's, here's the liveness proof. So if the network is good and we're after GST, then I claim that an honest leader can always get his block proposal notarized and then finalized, okay? And the fact that we're going to rely on is that if some honest player enters iteration H by time T and T is greater than GST, then every honest player will enter iteration H soon thereafter, after one message delay by time T plus little delta. Little delta is the message delay. And this is just because when an honest player enters an iteration, it will send its notarized blockchain of length H minus one to everyone else. Okay. So here's the proof. Let T be when the leader of iteration H enters, uh, enters iteration H and when it proposes a new block. Subclaim Y. Every honest node will see a notarization for some block of high H by time T plus two little delta. Okay, so we know that by time T plus little delta, uh, every honest player enters iteration H and sees the proposal. So they'll either vote for the block or one of them must have already entered the next iteration. So therefore, by one more message delay later, uh, every honest player should see some notarized block of IH. Subclaim two, the dummy block of IH cannot be notarized in any honest view before this time t plus two little delta. Why is this true? Well, the earliest any honest player can enter iteration H is at time t minus delta. Uh, and the earliest any honest timer can fire is three little or three big delta after that. Um, so you can sort of see, hey, the timer's just not going to fire by time t plus two little delta. Uh, so whatever block got notarized uh, has to be a valid, like a real block. Um, so they all send a finalized message and everyone should finalize their chains. All right, the final little claim of this talk is liveness for faulty leaders. So if the network is good, any iteration, even with the faulty leader, should conclude after three big delta plus little delta time. And this is just because, well, if enough time has elapsed, either everyone will uh, fire their timers and vote for the dummy block, um, or some honest processes already enter the next iteration, uh, in which case, um, you know, everyone will enter the next iteration soon thereafter. Okay, so that's simplex consensus in a nutshell. Um, I thank you, and hopefully it's, it's interesting. Thanks, Benjamin. We have time for one super quick question. So maybe I'll ask one. Um, do you have a sense for how the protocol behaves in in the fully asynchronous settings? Um, the protocol isn't exactly well defined in the fully asynchronous setting uh, because, so when we vote for the dummy block, we time out, we have to wait uh, some preordained amount of time in which we have to allow the honest guys to try to do some work. Uh, in the asynchronous setting, we have no such upper bound on how long we have to wait. Uh, so yeah, asynchronous protocols are also very interesting. Uh, and active research. Thank you.
So let's thank the speaker again. Oh, okay, so our next talk will be online. Um, and uh, I was told that uh, you can still ask questions because the speaker will be online. Um, but yeah, without further ado, um, so let me welcome Rudvik Patel. Uh, we're going to talk about concurrent asynchronous Byzantine agreement in expecting constant rounds revisited and play the video. I think it's on the bottom right of the player. Also, we must see it. Round preserving. My name is Rupik Patel, and I'm going to talk about our work revisiting the problem of obtaining concurrent asynchronous Byzantine agreement and expected content rounds. This is joint work with Ron Cohen, Puyan Fergani, Juan Garay, and Vasil Sikas. Let me start by introducing the problem of Byzantine agreement, or BA for short. Here we have n parties connected by a complete network of point to point channels. Up to T of the parties may be corrupted by an adversary who we assume is fully malicious or Byzantine. Each party PI has an input value VI, and we require two properties to hold agreement, meaning that all honest parties output the same value, and validity, meaning that if all honest parties start with the same value V, then that must be their common output. It's well known that without a trusted setup, like a PKI, uh, BA is possible only if less than a third of the parties are corrupted, T less than N over three. And this holds even if you allow cryptography or randomization. Uh, while this problem uh, originally comes from distributed computing, uh, BA, as well as its uh, closely related single center variant broadcast, are important building blocks in the construction of cryptographic protocols. We consider BA in an asynchronous network. In this model, there's no global notion of time within the protocol. And messages sent over a channel uh, are only guaranteed to be delivered eventually. In particular, the adversary can delay messages for an arbitrary yet finite amount of time. The main challenge in this setting is that you can't distinguish between a silent corrupted party uh, who's not sending messages and a slow honest party whose messages are simply delayed. As a result, an honest party can't wait to receive messages from more than n minus t parties at any given stage in the protocol. The FLP possibility result states that a uh, no deterministic asynchronous BA or ABA protocol can tolerate the death of even a single party. Thus, randomization is necessary to achieve ABA. One primitive commonly used to provide this randomization is the oblivious common coin, or OCC, which guarantees that with constant probability, all honest parties have to the same random value, B and D. The coin is oblivious because the parties don't know whether agreement has been reached. This domain D need not be binary. In fact, its size can depend on N, uh, but even a binary OCC uh, is quite powerful. Raven show that ABA reduces to a binary OCC. The resiliency of this construction is quite poor, T less than N over 10, uh, but uh, he actually achieves expected constant round complexity. Feldman, in an unpublished manuscript, showed how to actually implement this binary OCC from seeker channels in constant rounds for T less than over four. He also gave a better reduction, uh, achieving expected constant round ABA uh, for T less than over three, which is optimal uh, from a binary OCC. Finally, uh, Canadian Raven completed the picture by constructing a binary OCC for T less than over three. Uh, let me just give you some idea of uh, how we can achieve ABA from a binary OCC. The high-level idea uh, is to proceed in rounds, starting with the original input values. And in case of disagreement, the parties adopt the value of the coin uh, 
uh, for the next iteration. Actually, a multi-value OCC is also generally useful for consensus tasks. For example, it enables a previous leader election, or OLE. Just being able to elect a random leader with constant probability can provide the parties with uh, sufficient coordination. To our surprise, asynchronous OLE doesn't seem to exist. Uh, a number of works by Benno and Ellen Eve, Fitzy and Bry, and others point to the paper of Kennedy and Rabin or, uh, or Feldman's manuscript uh, for instantiating this primitive. But uh, uh, a closer look reveals that, that these constructions provide a binary OCC only. And it's not immediately clear how to extend to larger non constant sized domains. For example, the obvious approach of running login executions in parallel only yields agreement with inverse polynomial probability. Clearly, this is a major hole in the literature uh, that has gone unnoticed for decades. More specifically, no existing OCC protocol is simultaneously optimally resilient, asynchronous, multivalued, and information theoretic. We provide the first construction satisfying all four requirements. We also investigate round preserving parallel composition of ABA. This turns out to be non trivial. And to see why, uh, we need to take a detour uh, to uh, so called uh, probabilistic termination protocols, by which I mean protocols uh, for which there's no uh, fixed upper bound on a party's termination round. This includes expected constant round ABA. Uh, as a simple example, consider flipping a coin. How many flips are expected until the coin comes from heads? The answer is obviously two, and fixing the bias of the coin, in general, a constant number of flips are expected. Now, what if we flip n coins in parallel? How many flips are expected until they all come up heads? Here, the answer is log n, and viewing these flips as deciding on uh, whether to terminate in a round or iteration, the conclusion is that running probabilistic termination protocols concurrently doesn't preserve expected round complexity. Motivation is that we often compose multiple uh, BA instances in MPZ protocols, and we would like to do so without blowing up the wrong complexity. Ben and Renaud pointed out this issue, and they actually solved concurrent BA, synchronous BA, uh, as well as concurrent ABA, uh, still in expected constant rounds for T less than n over three. Upon uh, investigating their asynchronous protocol, however, we discover a number of issues. Uh, first, let me give a brief. Um, uh, let me briefly review their uh, construction. The idea is to run a batch of executions per uh, ABA instance for a small constant number of rounds, and uh, setting parameters appropriately, um, this guarantees that with constant probability, at least one execution per instance will have terminated. Parties can then select a representative output for each instance. Uh, however. The parties might not terminate in the same round for each instance. Uh, so they need to distribute these uh, vectors uh, of candidate outputs uh, and then elect the leader to coordinate. The same general idea underlies their synchronous construction, but uh, due to message distribution issues in asynchrony, their asynchronous, their concurrent ABA protocol is very complicated. Uh, and there are some issues in the proof. Uh, it also suffers from missing building blocks asynchronous OLE, which we can instantiate using our multi-valued OCC, but also multi-valued ABA in expected constant rounds. And for the same reasons I discussed on the last slide, this doesn't follow directly from binary ABA in expected constant rounds. We address all these issues by designing a new protocol, uh, which is simple and modular. Before I get into the technical uh, content, let me end with this uh, bird's eye view of the asynchronous landscape for T less than number three. So we would like to obtain expected constant round asynchronous MPC uh, from point-to-point -point channels uh, for which we have the recent construction of Cohen. This relies on expected constant round concurrent ABA. Uh, the protocol of Benor and Arneev relies on expected constant round multi-value ABA, which we can instantiate using the OCC-based binary ABA protocol of Canadian Robin, along with the reduction, uh, uh, the extension, from binary to multi-valued ABA of most of our Um, But uh, Ben Renault Needs protocol also relies on constant round asynchronous OLE. And as you can see, that box is just hanging. Uh, so in this work, we fill in that gap and we also propose a new uh, expected constant round concurrent ABA protocol. 
we now can use some, uh, we now go over our multi-value OCC construction in some detail. As a starting point, we look, we take the binary OCC of uh, Feldman and Canadian Rabin. Recall that Feldman uh, achieved resiliency T less than N over four and Canadian Rabin optimal resiliency T less than N over three. Uh, but the OCC protocols are essentially the same once you instantiate, uh, once you realize asynchronous uh, VSS. Uh, at a high level, the protocol proceeds as follows. Each party starts by secret sharing in random field elements, one per party. And after some rounds of message exchange and reconstruction, a vector of n random field elements uh, becomes fixed. Uh, and n minus t elements uh, of this vector are visible to each party PI. Uh, n minus t uh, due to asynchrony. However, in it, it is guaranteed that there's an intersection of size at least n over three among the local views of all honest parties. Uh, Feldman and Canadian Rubin extracted a single bit from this. Uh, we were able to do much better via a combinatorial lemma, which we believe uh, might be useful in other contexts as well. Consider a vector uh, of length n consisting of random values from some set S and let I be any constant fraction of indices in this vector. If the size of S is theta of n squared, then with the constant probability, there is uh, there will be at least one repeat in V, but all repeats will lie inside I. And the intuition for this is that when S has size O of n squared, uh, there is at least one repeat in any constant fraction of V with constant probability. This is essentially uh, due to the birthday paradox. And on the other hand, when S has size omega of n squared, there will be no repeats in V at all. With constant probability. There's a sweet spot between these extremes that can be leveraged to extract uh, shared randomness. To apply the lemma, we take that uh, vector of uh, uh, random field elements at the end of the OCC protocol. When t is less than n over three, we have a common subset of indices, uh, common subset of n over three indices uh, known to all honest parties. Then if we work over a field of size n squared, and have parties output the repeat with minimum index or maximum index, doesn't really matter. Uh, and then the local view, we get an n squared valued asynchronous OCC. Uh, this can be easily generalized to arbitrary domains, even exponential size domains. And as a special case, when the size of the domain is n, we get asynchronous uh, release leader election. Uh, lastly, let me uh, give you some idea of how we, uh, how our simplified concurrent ABA protocol works. Um, uh, as well as uh, uh, discuss the issues uh, in Ben and L. Neves concurrent ABA protocol. Uh, I said earlier that there are uh, there's low dispersion uh, in asynchronous networks. Let me elaborate on that first. Suppose we have three T plus one parties, uh, uh, which uh, distribute their messages using a reliable broadcast protocol. Um, if we look at the messages received by two parties, P1 and P2, uh, the adversary can manipulate delays so that the size of the overlap is only t plus one. When we add a third party to the mix, this decreases to one. And with just four parties, the intersection of their views can be empty. However, all honest parties will eventually receive each other's messages. So n minus c parties should have an overlap of size n minus t. Ben and and Eve uh, achieved this with a sequence of primitives, a cast, a cast plus, spread, select. Never mind what those are. But uh, the point is that this is a layered structure with non-black box calls to lower level primitives. And this makes their concurrent ABA protocol error prone and difficult to analyze. And in fact, uh, there are some issues with part of their analysis. Uh, in the paper, we actually give an attack. Uh, we also show that the idea that all this complexity in, uh, comes with a territory is really a myth. Indeed, our solution is uh, much simpler. Uh, following Ben and Eve, we start by running uh, uh, a batch of truncated executions for each ABA instance. Then we run uh, ABA on continuation. If the parties decide to continue, uh, then they are able to distribute uh, a representative output for each instance. Now here we add uh, several rounds of message exchange and show using a counting argument that messages from at least n over three parties are received by all honest parties. Then we uh, use our asynchronous oblivious leader election 
uh, protocol to let the leader. Uh, and finally, we run multi-valued ABA on the leader's output vector. Uh, and this doubles as agreement on termination. Uh, this is not quite enough, however, uh, as we need to validate the output. So, uh, for, and for this, we make use of some additional properties of ABA, which are nevertheless uh, easy to obtain, uh, along with some validation that occurs in the distribution uh, stage. Uh, and in this way, we obtain expected constant around uh, for an ABA. As you can see from this side-by-side -side comparison uh, with Ben and El Neve's concurrent synchronous BA protocol, uh, our protocol is uh, remarkably simple. And this is pretty much the ideal. Uh, uh, this is pretty much ideal uh, when designing uh, an asynchronous counterpart to a synchronous protocol. In summary, uh, we construct the first optimally resilient asynchronous, multi-valued, and information theoretic OCC. Uh, this feasibility result is novel and yet has been assumed in the literature. We, we also construct the first simple and sound expected constant round concurrent ABA protocol for the optimal TLS number three. Um, and we also give a composable treatment in UC. Uh, this presents some interesting uh, modeling, uh, some, some interesting challenges in, in the modeling uh, in the simulation, uh, which we deal with. Thank you, and uh, please see the, the full version on Mayprint. My name is Rupik Patel, and I'm going to talk about our re work revisiting the problem of obtaining concurrent asynchronous Byzantine group. Thank you. Um, so we're running a little bit late on schedule, but maybe we have time for one super quick question for Rodrik, who should be online. Meantime, the next speaker can start getting ready. Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, so for our next and in fact, last talk of the conference, we have uh, Gilad Stern, who's going to talk about zombies and ghosts, optimal Byzantine agreement in the presence of commission falls, please. Thank you. Um, so thank you, I'm Gilad. I'll be talking about uh, mixed fault tolerance. Uh, this work is a joint work with uh, William Lops. So a little bit of background on our model. Um, we're going to work in a synchronous network of n parties. And um, by synchronous here, I just mean the regular round-based models. And we have n parties that have point-to-point -point, uh, point -point channels and can just talk to each other. Um, in this network, yeah. Um, in this type of network or in this type of kind of task, we often uh, have all kinds of different fault types. So for example, we sometimes deal with Byzantine faults. Uh, Byzantine are just fully malicious parties that can deviate from the protocol and you know, hurt it actively. Um, we have received faulty parties that might have messages sent to them dropped. We have sent faulty parties that are the opposite. Messages that they send can be dropped. And finally, we have uh, crash uh, parties that just stop participating in the protocol fully. Um, these are some of the most common types of faults. Now, throughout this talk, uh, T, R, S, and C are going to be the numbers of uh, Byzantine received, send, and uh, crash faulty parties, respectively. Now, ideally, I would like to always kind of have Byzantine fault tolerance. Uh, in some sense, it's the most tolerant. Uh, I can think of other faults as kind of special cases of Byzantine uh, faults. Now, there's an issue that Byzantine faults are a little limiting. So, for example, we know how to do uh, Byzantine consensus with n greater than 3t. We know we can't do any better. Um, but if we just deal with um, omission faults, for example, with received faults, we can deal with any number of received, uh, received faults if we want. So we can kind of deal with more, uh, more benign faults, unsurprisingly. Now, uh, in addition to that, in addition to that being limiting, it might not always be realistic to have re really large uh, attacks, really large Byzantine faults. So in some networks, I can say, maybe I'll have a small number of parties uh, actively attack me, but the network might still be highly unreliable and some parties might not receive messages or might have messages dropped. So it's not only limiting, it might not be necessary all the time. We kind of want to talk about how to deal with both types of faults at the same time. 
All right, so we're not the first ones to think about this task. Um, there has been a lot of work about this. Uh, there's been some work in the 90s. There's been uh, a little bit of work in the 2000s. And we know how to do all kinds of stuff. So for example, we know how to do unauthenticated consensus with n greater than 3t plus c in the crash case and n greater than 3t plus r plus s in the uh, omission case. Now, there are all kinds of works that do this. Um, these are just three of the most resilient work we know. Uh, what we know about. Now, recently, both uh, Yulin and I worked on kind of uh, doing some more, uh, kind of extending this line of research. Um, the first of these two of these two works deals with authenticated consensus um, with n greater than two t plus c. And here, by authenticated and unauthenticated, which mean without uh, without having um, signatures or with having signatures. And the uh, second of these works. Uh, achieves uh, resilience of n greater than 2t plus r plus s in the uh, omission case. Now, a note on the second work, two notes. First, they also have a lower bound um, that uh, shows that you can't do any better than 2t plus r plus s. It's not possible. Now, unfortunately, they don't quite solve the problem as stated. Uh, in order to get this resilience, they assume spotty faults. And spotty faults are kind of this um, extra assumption of faults in which uh, we state that the adversary has to choose in each round either to drop all of the messages for a given party or none of them. It can't drop, let's say, three of them and make the others go through. So uh, it, it should be noted that they also have another protocol that doesn't assume this uh, spotty, uh, spotty failure, but it's less resilient. In this work, we close this, with, uh, this gap and show an authenticated consensus protocol for n greater than 2t, two t, two t plus r plus s without any assumption on, on kind of the fault structure. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we do this. I'm not gonna talk a lot about, a lot about how we do this because uh, consensus protocols can be a little scary, these taxes protocols. I'm gonna talk about kind of the major ideas in our solutions. Um, Zika's house and Mauel, one of the, uh, in one of the papers I cited in the previous slide, um, show how to how to solve this type of task by using self-detection. They noted that the omission parties won't actively deviate from the protocol, at least intentionally, but they might act on partial information if they don't receive messages. And that's often just as dangerous. So they rely on these parties, specifically on received faulty parties, to detect their own failures and then stop participating. If, if, if they see that they're going to hurt the protocol. And they call this uh, zombification. They become zombies and stop participating. Um, they do this, they start by solving just point-to-point -point sending, regular message sending in a detectable way. Um, and then they kind of construct a, pro a consensus protocol on top of that. So how does this work uh, conceptually? Here we have a network. We have the smiley faces or non-faulty parties. The monkeys with hands on their ears are receive faulty. They might not hear stuff. The monkeys with hands on their mouths are send faulty. They might not send stuff. Um, and we want to solve the very simple task of sending a single message. That's it. We want to do this in a detectable way. So if we just send the message normally, we don't add any more information, and this message is dropped, the, uh, receive, uh, the receiving party just doesn't really know what happened, right? It could be the case the sender is Byzantine and decided not to send a message, or send faulty, and the message could have dropped. Or maybe the receiver is received faulty, and it should detect its own fault. Right? And if it doesn't do that, then we, we failed in our task. So they uh, propose to not send messages directly, but to send them through the whole network. When you send the message through the whole network, some of the messages still might be dropped. Right? So for example, the top left monkey um, is received faulty, it might not hear the message. And then every party forwards what they heard to the recipient. And, and it should be noted that parties always forward stuff, even uh, always say what they heard, even if they heard nothing. Right? So the top left monkey is forwarding the bottom message. I didn't hear anything. Now, some of these messages can also be dropped. And now the recipient just counts. It checks how many messages it received. If it received a large number of messages, um, we need to actually do the counting, but we can argue that it received uh, the correct message from the sender as well, and it can just continue the protocol normally. 
and act as if it received it only, as if, as if it received a direct value. Now, on the other hand, if a lot of the messages are dropped, it can know that it has actually received all. Right? It knows that it cannot be the case that it, it heard very few messages if it is not faulty itself. And then it can detect itself and become a zombie and stop participating. Act as if it received nothing and stop from this point. On. So in our work, we detect this idea to also include send faults. And we have send faulty parties also detect their faults, stop participating by becoming ghosts in addition to uh, received faulty parties becoming zombies. Uh, we define undead versions of protocols that kind of include this idea of, uh, of detection. And we want the detection to have two properties. So first we want only correct detections in some sense. We want that only received faulty parties will become go uh, zombies and only sent faulty parties will become ghosts. We don't want parties to detect themselves unless they're actually faulty. Now, a second thing here um, is we want parties to detect themselves if they don't act correctly. We definitely want that to happen. So if a party is not a zombie or a ghost, that means it actually sent or, uh, sent or received the message correctly, and that's the only reason that it becomes a ghost or a zombie. Um, and we start with uh, another primitive uh, weak multicast. So here we have another network. Uh, we have a sender on the left, um, maybe your right side, stage left, sorry, right. Um, on the, the far end, um, it is sent faulty. Um, and the, uh, it, it wants to do the kind of very simple task of just sending a message to everybody. That's the task of multicast. Sending a message to party one, then to party two, then to party three, et cetera. Now we want to do this in a detectable in, in a way that it can detect it own, its own fault, um, and here we want it to detect itself unless at least one uh, honest non-faulty party heard the message. So if at least one non-faulty party heard the message, it can continue acting normally, and if that is not the case, then it should become a ghost. Um, that is, as a side note, that is enough because if at least one non-faulty party heard the message, it will be able to forward it in the next round. And everybody will hear it in the next round. So it's a very kind of weak requirement, but it's strong enough for us. So here, we want to send the message to everybody. And again, like before, if we don't do something to kind of detect our own faults, um, the message could be dropped everywhere. And the sender just won't know that it was dropped, right? Unless people say something. So this is not enough. We can't just multicast normally. What can we do? Um, we can have the, uh, the sender send the message. Note that some of these messages may be dropped, right? Let's, for example, the top two parties uh, can uh, receive faulty, so they might not receive the message. And then afterwards, parties will reply with the messages they received or bottom if they didn't hear anything. And now we kind of do the same trick. We just count. Um, if the sender receives a large number of bottom, oh, sorry, a small number of bottom values, it knows that at least one non-faulty party heard the message and we're fine. Uh, in the next round, thing will, things will work out. And just continue in the protocols. Now, on the other hand, since the sender is actually sent fault in, in this picture, a lot of the messages can drop. And if a lot of the messages drop, then it will receive a lot of bottom values as, as replies, right? If it receives a very large number of bottom values, it knows that it actually must be faulty, right? It cannot be the case that nobody heard from it, but it's not faulty, or very few people heard from it. If that is the case, it can become a ghost and stop participating in the protocol in order not to hurt the, the rest of the program. All right. So these are kind of the basic ideas in our protocol. It should be noted that I'm actually slightly lying. Um, parties actually also do zombification in the other protocol, but kind of the new idea is this, also noticing us and faults. Um, in conclusion, uh, we wanted to bring up mixed fault as a reasonable model. We think it's reasonable. We think it's often uh, very realistic and kind of easier to deal, deal with. We formulate undead versions of consensus and related protocols. We construct an authenticated undead consensus protocol for n greater than 2t plus r plus s, mat which matches the lower bound. And like other works, we rely on self-detection and extend the idea of zombification to ghosts as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, questions?
not. Um, let's thank the speaker again, as well as all the speakers of the conference. And uh, but before you go, I think uh, yeah, uh, oh, there are there is some announcement from yeah. There's a the closing room. remarks from the local chairs. But first, let's thank the speakers of the session and the conference. Okay, uh, so we have uh, some closing remarks. Uh,